Taking action for you. This morning on TV20 Detroit starts right now. Post me. Welcome to another edition of the Emmy-nominated Post Beat with Greg Dunmore. We're standing in front of Detroit's gorgeous riverfront with this international view of Canada. And we're also on the site of where Joe Louis Arena used to be. And now it is the site of Detroit's newest luxury apartment building, the Water Square. We're going to go to its rooftop where we're going to talk to the wondrous author, motivational speaker, and millionaire, Dr. Asha Tyson. And as we are in your, well, I call it, um, um, why go on a vacation when you live here, which used to be Joe Lewis Arena in the heart of downtown Detroit. And we're celebrating in this rooftop um, setting, which is why go to Hollywood, just go to the rooftop here. But you made several um, metaphors with the building and what it symbolizes in terms of your journey. Would you just briefly go over that? Because yeah. you said something very profound. You're gonna make me cry. <laughs> this is what I didn't want to do, was cry. So it's something about the height. Now, I am afraid of heights, and I, I've tried to overcome that. I've jumped out of an airplane 14,000 feet out of the air, thought that would do it. It didn't. I'm just glad I landed on my feet and all was well there. Um, and so, you know, the top still afraid of heights but it is something so profound about being high it makes everything so minuscule and so tiny that it helps me to um, really hone in on the perspective of just how insignificant my life is and when I say that I don't mean to the sense of um, you know no self-esteem in that regards but in terms of just how large the world is and and how large I believe I'm, I'm you know I make no apologies for being Christian and and how large my God is and what he's done for me and loving my little bitty self despite it all in in a world that I mean just so huge it's like he sees me he loves me and it it just floors me it it leaves me speechless and not much else does. How much can you pack in 55 years? How much, how many books, how many processes, um, how many courses, how many classes, how many friends can you pack into 55 years? There's family, there's middle school, there's high school, there's first jobs, there's college, those that came later on, that those that you may have helped ghost write a book or two. Book or two. Book or two. <laughs> How much can you put into 55 years? And the answer is all that God will allow. Looking at you in your regalia that is so, it's regal and it signals I am a PhD, but you've got a badge of metal that is so magnificent. Let us know about the metal. So I was awarded, I, not only, it's not just about making money, it's also about how you use it as a tool to help others. So I do quite a bit of volunteer work and uh, and I was recognized for some of that work uh, during the Obama administration. So that's the lifetime of, yeah. That is something that is history making, you know. It does, uh, for volunteer services. Uh, lifetime achievement is not complete unless you're doing some giving and you're sharing what you've come to learn. Um, and not just monetary, but also time and uh, and a company recognized my work and uh, wrote in to the Obama administration and that was how it happened. I, I wasn't working on it, trying for it, just putting one foot in front of the other was what I was doing. Now your life story is really a movie and how do you sum up a movie when you only have so much time? So I want you to unfold the story and then we're gonna talk about you as an author. But let's now talk about how your challenging life has been a yes, blessing. Yes, that's what it ultimately was. And I do get it now. I wasn't real clear on it before, but I get why Maya Angelou said, 
Uh, I take nothing for my journey now. I get it. I absolutely get it. It's invaluable. It's my journey, and I take nothing for it. So I was born in Detroit to a dying woman. My mother did indeed have sickle cell anemia. She was a single mom, and she raised me alone. I knew who my father was, but I did not always know where he was. He was absent uh, from the home. And uh, my mother did her best. She really did. It took some years for me to come to know that, but she did her best. She, with the help of a state provided housekeeper in those days, she kept a clean home and she kept me clean and she made sure I was in school and that I got my schoolwork done. And um, my mother with age became uh, mentally ill. She became, by the time I was 17 years old, she had become homicidal, schizophrenic, and she had tried to kill me several times. It wasn't uncommon, Greg, to find myself bound to the bed with rope or beaten until I passed out, uh, thrown through glass doors and windows, left to sleep outside in Michigan, which as you know, could be below zero weather. And that is because she was in and out of reality. And, uh, and I couldn't get help. You know, back then, uh, they really just chalked it off to, you teenagers think you know everything, you know, you just go back home, honey, work things out with your mom, and I'm trying to tell them, this isn't, you know, teenage stuff. This isn't, I want to date some guy with a van, or this isn't, I'm trying to get a tattoo. You know, this is, my mother doesn't always recognize me, and I could wake up to her brandishing a knife. And so I couldn't get help. I didn't really fit, Greg. Um, so that mental illness really led me into uh, a devastating place. By the time I was 17, I had lived uh, 12 different places my senior year in high school. Uh, just, you know, living with friends here, friends there. Nobody could really take in a child and commit to it. Uh, I was like a virtual orphan. So I ultimately ended up just homeless. One of the mothers of one of the children I went to school with, she just said, listen, I'm not gonna be able to take care of another kid. I'm barely taking care of my own. She made a few phone calls and took me to the Baldwin Avenue Methodist Church in Pontiac, which operated a homeless shelter in their basement. And I didn't fit the profile there either. I didn't fit, I wasn't supposed to be there. The way the shelter ran was children were only allowed if they were accompanied by an adult. I didn't have an adult and I was considered a minor at 17. Uh, you also were only supposed to be there for two weeks. So I wrote a letter, I wrote a letter to the pastor and I told him I had goals, that I had dreams. Wasn't sure how I was gonna get there, I didn't tell him that part, but, <laughs> but I told him I, I had a plan and I had planned to do great things with my life. And if he would let me stay until I graduated from high school, which would have got, held me there in the shelter for about two months, not two weeks, and no parent. So I said, I won't cause any trouble. I'll go to school in the day. Just please let me stay here until I graduate. I got to get that high school diploma. And that worked. And I believed that education was gonna be my ticket out. And I went to a college that did not expect me. I have packed everything I owned. What I didn't know yet is that Greyhound had lost it all. <laughs> yes, on the way up there. I paid extra and everything. I bought this, my last money from working an Arby's job from the homeless shelter. Last money, I bought this one-way bus ticket and I paid extra to have them ship some of my things over to this school. Never did see those things again, Greg, but I kept pushing. So now I have chicken wings in a shoebox. that's all I got, and $80 in my pocket, and the clothes on my back. I go into administration, and essentially I beg my way in. I was in Hancock, Michigan, yes. and SUMI was a two-year school at the time. Uh, they later, fast forward uh, to modern times, they later turned into a four-year university, Finlandia University, that unfortunately closed last year. But that school was a blessing to me. I, they let me in. Here's the thing, I went up to them, brave and all, and I sat down, the lady asked me name, she wasn't looking up, because this is the first day of school, it's like a zoo on campuses, the first day of school. People are moving in, trying to get classes, you know, things are falling through the cracks, people are everywhere. She's like, name, and I, I tell her. Now, I don't think I'm in her system, but I tell her anyway, I don't know, maybe we'll both be surprised. <laughs> I tell her, sure enough, it wasn't in there. And so I just level with her. She said, uh, I don't see you here. I said, ma'am, let me just tell you, my mother's dying and she's lost her mind. If you know where my father is, you tell me and we'll both know. If I took all the right tests, I promise you I got all the wrong answers. But what I do have is integrity and I know how to work hard. If you will help me get into this school, 
I will do something with my life or I'll just die trying. I'll never give up. I need a shot. I'm not asking for a handout. I'm asking for a hand up. Can you help me? That was what I said. That's what got me into college, Greg. Stay tuned and we'll be right back. More with Postby with Greg Dunmore. Postby. Because I live in Detroit, I was able to get tuition-free college through the Detroit Promise. I feel very fortunate working with the Detroit Promise. They were able to afford me so many opportunities. I'm currently studying media production and journalism at University of Michigan Dearborn. I'm looking to take my talents further into the production industry, uh, short films. I love working with people here, and this is where I want to be. And that's why I'm Detroit for life. Detroit. Join the My Neighborhood Matters campaign and register for the biggest citywide community service day in the nation right here in Detroit. It's the 18th annual Arise Detroit Neighborhoods Day, Saturday, August 3rd, and neighborhoods all over the city. Have your church, community group, or block group show their neighborhood pride by hosting an event like a health fair, school spy giveaway, or a beautification project. Register today at AriseDetroit.org, that's AriseDetroit.org, and receive banners, t-shirts, and resource support for your community project. Or phone 313-921-1955. It's been said that Nelson Mandela was asked at a later point in his life, what would you want more of, more knowledge or more money? And he responded, more money. And people thought, why would you say more money, which seemed so superficial, given that it yes, is true yeah. that knowledge is divine. He said, well, look at it this way. I don't ask God for things I don't need. <laughs> He had a lot of knowledge and understood the importance of money. So I'm saying that you retired at age 26. It's not just about the leisure, but the luxury of being financially solvent and in a position to pay your bills. Well, let me get to the point. How does it feel to be a millionaire? Oh my God, he just breaks with it. You know, interestingly enough, uh, the day that I hit the first millionth dollar, would you believe I, it, it wasn't, you would think it's, you would hear thunder roar or you would hear, it really, you, because getting to that, Greg, it's something that's happening to you all along. You know, I often tell my clients, I say, you know, Make the goal becoming a millionaire, not for the money, but for what it will make of you to become it. Because you'll have to do it for what it will require of your communication skills, what it will require of you learning about taxes, uh, about self-esteem, about confidence, about uh, negotiation, about humility. Can you enter a room full of people who know less than you and still have the humility to serve? Can you enter a room full of people who know more than you and still know that I still have something to contribute here? Um, you're doing it for the character. I tell you, that day, I just, I took my, we went to Red Lobster. We, I mean, it wasn't even really like a super big deal. I didn't go to a super expensive restaurant. I had a taste for, you know, shrimp alfredo, so that's what we did. Now, you know, people get this confused. People often get this confused. They will say, um, money is the root of all evil, but it's actually the love of money that is all evil. What say you, Dr. Tyson? I would have to agree with that 100%. Um, so it was never the money that I loved. It was always the ability to serve people and to realize that you deserve to be compensated for your gifts. And putting those two together, the service and the compensation for the problem that you're solving is going to bring the money. And the money is a tool so that you can do more of the same, which is service, more of the service. It's a cycle. It's a prosperity cycle. Now, your book entitled How I Retired with an E-D at the end, <laughs> Retired, yes, was it a calling that yes, you sir. were in bed and, and God said you shall retire at age 26? Or did you evolve to understand you could do that? I evolved into understanding that I could do it, in particular when I had decided that retirement had a stale definition and that what we needed in society was a new retire mentality. 
we needed to understand that retirement did not mean set out to pasture, stop using your gifts, and you know, sit my ties on the beach until you die. No, human beings were engineered to serve. We're engineered to do, to go. If you think about it, most people, if you were to interview many people that are working nine to five jobs, if they are wanting to quit, if they would rather do something else, that is indeed what they want. They would rather do something else. They're never looking to, I just want to get out of here and do nothing. That's never it. It's always, I would rather be doing and then fill in that blank on what that dream is. Most people really want to do something. They just want to do something more fulfilling. I retired at 26, a step-by-step -step guide to assessing your freedom and wealth at any age. And we never changed the cover, Greg. We yeah, did, and my team and I decided not to change the cover. I'm old enough now to be her mother. And your baby <laughs> was born in 2001, which yes. means that your baby now is 23 years old. Yes, yes, old. yes. So like, <laughs> and why were you motivated to write this book? Were you yes. surprised that it became a bestseller and that it is a, a, it's an evergreen that will never go out of yeah. publication? Yeah, yeah. So let us know. So I was inspired to write it because I'm often someone who listens to what the need is. I, I don't just create because I think I have something to create. Um, I, I don't know that I'm that kind of creative. Um, I wait to hear where the need is. What's hurting? What, can, what pain can I soothe? Uh, what's the problem? What can I answer? Um, and I was speaking, I was traveling the country and I was uh, speaking for Fortune 500 companies and for blue chip nonprofit organizations, teaching interpersonal skills and leadership and communication skills. And I would tell, as part of the introduction, I would tell a little bit of my story and people would say, oh, you ought to write a book. Oh, you ought to write a book. And I heard it so often, so many parts of the country from people who look so different, all different ages, all different uh, uh, nationalities. And so I thought, well, maybe, maybe I should write a book. Maybe it could uplift. Maybe, maybe it would make a difference. So that's where the inspiration came from. I heard a need and I thought I was answering to a call. But uh, it really does start with the mindset. Money is everywhere. I mean, after you gain a mindset of abundance, you will struggle not to make money. It's kind of like it falls at you at that point. But the question really becomes, do you understand what it means to have a growth mindset, an abundant mindset? And I would recommend that be the first place you start. The second takeaway would be allow the challenges to build you. If you let them wear you down like a bar of soap, you'll lose your hope and without hope you won't be able to see the glass half full and you have to see through a, a lens of op optimistic understanding or you won't be able to see what's in front of you it, I mean really it, it could be a million dollars laying there but you will miss it if you are sh you're shifted in a way that's pessimistic um, the third thing that I would say is be gentle with yourself most people are as hard on themselves as was someone who bullied them when they were in their youth, or as was a parent who had not treated them with the kind of respect a parent should treat them with. Make sure you're not continuing the job of your enemy. May God bless you so you can continue to bless us, Doctor. Oh, I love saying Doctor. Doctor Asha Tyson, the amazing, remarkable Doctor Asha Tyson. Pulse me. Major League Baseball has a long history, but for too long, only white players were allowed to play in the MLB. So black players built their own leagues and wrote their own history. Hamtramck Stadium was completed in 1930 and was home field for the Detroit Stars, one of the league's founding members. Today, just five original league stadiums still stand, including this one. 
Legends played here in Hamtramck. Andy Cooper, a Southpaw, a Southpaw with 120 wins. Turkey Stearns, a six-time home run leader and recent major, yes. We got family in the house today, so. Recent Major League Hall of Fame inductee who led the team in nearly every batting statistic. And Michigan-born Ron Teasley, one of the league's last surviving players. He shared this field with Willie Mays, may he rest in power, and even number 42 himself, Jackie Robinson. 18 players who played right here in Hamtramck Stadium made it all the way to Cooperstown. So their stories are baseball history. And I'm so proud that this stadium was restored and grateful that the MLB decided to incorporate their achievements into the official record books. I wanna thank everyone who was a part of that story, the past and currently keeping it alive today because those stories matter. Their achievements must count and we must educate and remind people about it. And that's why we're here today on Juneteenth. Today's legislation will enshrine that here in Michigan. We acknowledge players who made history and honor their memories. Everyone deserves to play and every story deserves to be told and remembered. And that's why today I'm gonna to be signing Representative Helena Scott's bipartisan bill to honor the history of black baseball players and teams in Michigan. This day is a powerful liberation and I'm proud to share that Michigan has taken significant steps to honor both Juneteenth and the Negro Leagues. Last year, my legislation to formally recognize Juneteenth as a state holiday, Public Act 215 was enacted. This legislation not only memorializes a pivotal moment in history, but also reaffirms our commitment to educating future generations about the profound impact of slavery and the long journey towards equality. We cannot afford to forget the history of our country. Let us know why this bill is distinctively remarkable. So the Negro League Day bill is remarkable because we are celebrating the history, the legacy of our Negro League players. My great uncle Ron, who is 97 years old, was an original Negro Leaguer. He actually played on this field in Hamtramck. So that's why it was so important for me to make sure, and that in addition to not just him, but the other players, the Turkey Stearns family, to make sure that I got this bill across the finish line. I've been working on this legislation, honestly, for about almost four years. Uh, my first term in office, I had my great uncle Ron up at the Capitol, we honored him with the tribute on both years of my first term. And then when we got majority two years ago, I said, you know what, I'm gonna work tirelessly and relentlessly to make sure that this becomes law in the state of Michigan because we had majority of the House and the Senate and I knew that I could get the votes and I had the confidence and the support of our great Speaker of the House, Joe Tate, that was totally behind this 100%. So. I'm so proud and honored that I was able to do this um, for the legacy of all the ball players and to make sure that this happened across the finish line. On the Juneteenth and also celebrating now the um, legacy of the late great Willie Mays. One of the greatest men ever played the game. First, I want to thank Helena for having the vision to put the resources in this field. Because when I was a county commissioner, when I, when I toured that, uh, that stadium, the, it, um, the, the stands were dry rotted, and I was trying to do something I didn't get the help. But you know, God works it out anyway, mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to be me. It took a young lady and a beautiful woman named Helen, Helen, Helen Scott to bring it to reality. So to me, it's very special to me because my dad played in there in the 30s. And he went to high, Hamtramck High School. They lived on Dyer, went to Copernicus. Copernicus became it was the high school back in those days, and it's very sentimental to me. I, would, I want to also thank the Hamtramck Conservancy that really worked really hard and diligently to make sure that this field was restored to its original glory. So we want to thank them and honor them as well. The stadium was listed in the National Register of Historic Places in 2012, kickstarting the formation of the nonprofit Friends of Historic Hamtramck Stadium Group with the mission to return it to use while honoring the history of Negro League Baseball. The rehabilitation effort was substantial. The original grandstand steel structure and roof were completely rehabilitated, and the seating and ramps were reconstructed. 
much of the work to the field met the specifications used by minor league baseball teams. Numerous local and federal partners contributed to the effort, including funds from the Community Development Block Grant Program, the Public Spaces Community Places Crowdfunding Match Program, the National Park Service, and several foundations. Wayne County acted as the developer for the $2.6 million project. The transformation concluded in June 2022 with a dedication ceremony and a Juneteenth Negro Leagues tribute game. Players wore custom-made Detroit Stars uniforms and played the first game on Norman Turkey Stearns Field, named for the Hall of Fame outfielder who called Detroit home. Hamtramck Stadium's rehabilitated grandstand and restored field are now a regional destination and a thriving community recreational resource, giving new life to its place in baseball history. We also are, 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 are thankful that those players also uh, had the privilege of gracing the field with Willie Mays. Um, I do want to take a minute to recognize this amazing champion, one of the best athletes to ever walk the face of the earth. And I'm a little bit proud because his people are from St. Paul, Alabama, my people are from. On Juneteenth, on a day where we celebrate freedom and people's understanding of their freedom, their access to their freedom, the realization that the freedom that was already theirs, that there is no more barrier that stands between them and their possibility and potential. That is what we unlock when we recognize history. So as we celebrate Juneteenth Freedom Day here in Michigan, as we celebrate the history and the foundation that the Negro Leagues played and laid here in Hamtramck, in Greater Detroit, and in the state of Michigan, we recognize that their legacy is the one upon which we stand, that positions all of us to be inspired by them and influenced by them to be our best and our fullest selves, to recognize our full potential, to deliver on the full access of health, to the dream of health and wealth that we all hold dear as human beings as Americans and I hope that we all can just uh, take a moment to reflect on this day about what these people the men the women who have graced this field what they have created the conditions for us to be able to achieve